Hi there everybody. I am very excited in this video to give you a complete rundown of this, the AOS 5 V2, and this, the AOS 5.5 V2. In this video, we're going to be going through everything you need to know about these two frames. We're going to be looking at the frames in detail on the bench. I'm going to be giving you some suggestions for components that you might want to use to build the frame out. We're going to be looking at a black box log analysis to see how the frames perform from a vibration and resonance perspective. Also, I'm going to be giving you some reasons why you might want to consider the AOS 5 V2 or 5.5 V2 instead of a dead cat style freestyle frame like the Apex DC or the iFlight Nazgul dead cat. So it's a lot to cover in one video. Let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into it. I'm excited to be able to offer the AOS 5 V2 and the AOS 5.5 V2 in a choice of colors. Obviously you can have standard black, just like any other frame, but if you're looking for something more vibrant, there's going to be blue, gold, green, and silver options for the carbon fiber, as well as a choice of different standoff colors as well. So let's look at the AOS 5 V2 on the bench. The frame supports up to 5.2 inch props, so if you like running those slightly larger 5.1 or 5.2 inch props, you can do that on this frame. The arm geometry is slightly different from the version one of the frame. You can see that where in the V1, the arm would come straight across from the standoff. In the version two, the second strut has been moved slightly back and it now meets the main strut of the arm about halfway along. Now, this provides a few key benefits. The first is that this strut is now slightly shorter than it was before, which helps save a little bit of weight. Also, this strut is better aligned with the carbon fiber weave than it would otherwise be, and that allows um, the strut to be made slightly thinner than it could be if it came across the front like this. Also, the weight that we're saving by making this strut shorter allows this main arm strut to be made a little bit thicker. And this helps really stiffen up a key resonant mode of the frame and raise that frequency even higher. And this allows the resonance performance of the V2 to be even slightly better than the resonance performance that was achieved with the V1. The arms are still two screw mounting for the arms. So should you ever need to replace an arm either because you've damaged it in a particularly hard crash, or you've started to um, delaminate the ends of these motor protectors after having a few crashes maybe on, on harder stuff like concrete or tarmac, then replacing the arm is super easy. You're just gonna undo these two screws, and neither of these screws is shared with any of your electronic stack, so you can just pull them straight out. Then you slide the old arm out and slide a replacement arm in and just do those two screws back up. So it's a very, very simple and easy arm replacement. So the motor mounting has changed for the V2 to this three point motor mounting. And this three point motor mounting has one key benefit, which is that in a hard front impact on the front of the arm, you get a lot of compressive stress in the back of the arm here. And carbon fiber really likes to fail in compression because if you imagine the fibers inside the material, in tension, they're really, really strong and you can't really break them. But in compression, they just sort of buckle. So carbon fiber tends to fail most commonly in compression. By moving to this three-point motor mounting, we remove the hole that would otherwise be here. And this hole can be a key stress riser and contribute to the compressive failure of the back of the arm. So by removing that stress riser and instead having a nice smooth curve and having a bit of a thicker section here, we can help increase the durability of the arm in front impacts. It also saves a little bit of weight as well because we remove that screw and also um, the associated carbon fiber. So it saves just a little bit of weight. And in my experience, three screws for motor mounting is more than enough and the motors are never gonna go anywhere. Particularly if you use just a little bit of uh, Loctite, thread lock, or um, some 
thick viscous grease on the screws to stop them backing out. So now looking at the electronics mounting options in the AOS 5 V2. We have a 30mm, 25mm and 20mm mount in the front, another 30, 25 and 20mm mount in the middle, and a third 30, 25 and 20mm mount in the rear. And all three positions will support the HD0 one watt VTX. So it's really a fantastically versatile frame from the point of view of mounting electronics. If you want to run a full-sized air unit in the frame, you absolutely can. Um, a full-size air unit will typically clash with um, a 30 mil stack in the middle, but is less likely to clash with a 20 mil stack. And if you want to run a full 30 mil stack with uh, the DJI air unit, full-size air unit, then you're probably better off putting the stack in the front of the frame and then the air unit in the back and having the middle of the frame for your capacitors, buzzer, and that sort of thing. If you're running a small 20 mil stack in the middle of the frame, you should be fine to fit an air unit behind it. Whatever electronics you want to mount, you're certain to be able to find a way to do it in this frame. There's just lots and lots of space. The top plate on the AOS 5 V2 has a couple of features that a lot of pilots requested after the, the V1 version of the frame. It's got two positions for battery straps, so you can have two captive battery straps that don't slide around, don't move forward and backward, and hold your battery really, really securely. You can see that the platform of the frame is quite wide in the middle. Now, this has a couple of benefits. The first is that it shortens the length of the arm that goes out to the motor, which improves stiffness, durability, and resonance performance. It also provides lots of space to have these captive battery straps, so you can strap down even quite a large battery very, very easily. And you can also see here that there is plenty of space for a cutout to have an XT60 connector coming up through the top plate so that you can keep your battery wires as short as possible, which is really good for performance, and also out of the way of the props. So you're never going to have battery wires that are exposed on the outside of the frame that could get chopped by the props. At the front of the frame, in the top plate, you can see that there are some press nuts installed here. Now this makes the standard 32mm by 32mm mounting, which is used on almost all AOS frames for GoPro mounting. So you can just screw a GoPro mount straight down into these two press nuts and into these two front standoffs and you're going to have a really, really secure mounting for your GoPro and there's absolutely no way that it's going to go anywhere, even in a very, very hard crash. The camera plates on the frame are 2.5mm thick carbon fibre and they have this universal mount that is used on a lot of other AOS frames that allows you to mount the camera however you'd want to. So it'll fit a DJI camera, 20 millimeter wide, or any 19 millimeter camera really, really well. And you can position the camera so that you can keep the camera plates out of view, but while still having enough of the camera plate protruding that it's gonna provide protection for your FPV camera in a crash. The geometry of this frame has been really carefully designed, so you're not gonna see any props in view, either in the FPV camera or in the HD footage from your GoPro. So if you're someone who really doesn't want props in view, but also is concerned about the durability and vibration performance of dead cat frames, because typically dead cat frames perform quite a bit worse in terms of vibration and resonance, and they can be a bit less durable as well, then this frame is going to provide that really great balance that you're looking for of a uh, squashed X geometry, but with a symmetric layout for the arms that gives the best vibration performance while still having your camera not, uh, not seeing those props. Let me take the top plate off now and I can show you what electronics I've got installed in this frame. So looking at the electronics installed in this frame, I have obviously the Cadex Vista VTX in the back with a UFL antenna that is strapped to the arm as I like to do it. That helps minimize the risk of having the antenna wobbling around and creating unnecessary vibration. 
In the center stack position, I've got a 20 by 20 stack. This is the iFlight uh, SuxX Mini F7 stack and the 55 amp ESC sitting below it. Um, this is a fantastic stack for a five inch drone. The 55 amp rating is loads and having uh, an F7 flight controller with twin gyros is always nice. Should you have one gyro that uh, fails for whatever reason, you've got a backup basically that you can switch to. In the front of the frame, I've got a thousand microfarad capacitor mounted with a FETTEC spike absorber mounted on the back of it. And if you're not using a TVS diode or a spike absorber on your build at the moment, it's definitely worth doing because it will just help protect your ESCs from any voltage spikes and prolong the life of the FETs. Any time that your motors change speed very violently, either because uh, of a sudden change in uh, your throttle command or because you've had a crash or something, it can cause a big spike, which will over time damage the FETs on your ESC. Having a spike absorber just helps catch that spike and reduce uh, the risk of that damage occurring. And overall, it's going to prolong the life of the ESC. The motors I'm using here are the iFlight Zing 2 2207 motors, which are just the right size for these five inch or up to 5.2 inch props. And uh, I'm using the 6S version. So I think they're 1855 kV. The camera in the front is from the Cadex Air unit, but it's a Nebula Pro camera. So um, you can fit any 19 millimeter or 20 millimeter camera between these camera plates. And you can see the XT60 connector on these very short wires is coming up through the top plate. And you could certainly consider 3D printing something to go around that. There's also space up front to mount any receiver. I'm using the DJI controller, so I can actually use the receiver that's built into the Cadex Vista. But if you wanted to use another type of receiver, Crossfire, Tracer, Express LRS, or Ghost, anything like that, you can find plenty of space up front to mount that receiver. Let's take a look now at the AOS 5.5 V2. Now, this is my preferred platform for carrying any of the heavier GoPro Hero style cameras. I typically use the AOS 5 for something like a GoPro Hero Session or one of the RunCam 5 cameras. But for carrying a heavier GoPro Hero camera, I like to run slightly bigger props. These 5.5 inch props carry a heavier GoPro Hero much, much better. You can see that the geometry is almost identical to the 5 inch version of the frame. We just have a slightly larger wheelbase and the frame also ends up slightly longer to keep the props out of view of the FPV camera in the front. The slightly longer frame of the AOS 5.5 allows you to run a full 30 by 30 stack in the center and a DJI Air unit in the back of the frame. And with the AOS 5, you would need to probably run a 20 by 20 stack in the middle of the frame if you wanted to fit the Air unit in. But because the AOS 5.5 is ever so slightly longer because of that larger wheelbase, you can squeeze the air unit in behind a full size stack. If you're looking at the AOS 5.5 V2 rather than the AOS 5, the only real difference that I would suggest in terms of electronics is perhaps looking at slightly larger motors. These are the iFlight Zing 2208 motors. So they're a little bit bigger, 12.5% bigger than the 2207s that I prefer for the AOS 5 V2. But other than that, Everything else on the frame is exactly the same as the AOS 5 V2. Now the AOS 5 V2 is really simple to build, but I still want to leave some build tips here in case maybe you're new to FPV, maybe this is your first AOS frame, or you're just looking for some guidance on how to get the most out of it. The main thing with the AOS 5 V2 is that before you start doing anything else, you need to assemble the stack screws onto the main plate. Now here I'm using 20 millimeter steel stack screws and I put a nut down the stack screw to sandwich the main plate of the frame between the head of the screw and the nut. And that's gonna give you a really, really secure stack mounting that doesn't want to move. And I would also suggest you use damping grease or thread lock on that nut so that it's never ever gonna come undone. If you've got multiple stacks, maybe you're putting a Cadex Vista in the back or something else in the front, 
then go ahead and install all the screws that you need into the frame before you start. If you're using a central stack position and you've got a 30 by 30 stack, you are going to need to use countersunk screws to uh, make sure that they don't interfere with the arms when you assemble the frame. But for any other mounting, you should be fine with just standard button head screws. Once you've assembled the stack screws, the rest of the build of the frame is really, really easy. The arms go underneath the main plate, first of all, not on top, like with the V1 of the AOS 5, they go underneath. And then the brace plates go on the bottom. They're the bottommost plates. And you can see here that we have a brace plate front and back. These are both symmetric. And there's also a central brace plate. And you can see here that it's good that we've installed the stack screws first because this central brace plate actually covers up the stack screws. So we can't access them once the arms and the brace plate are on. Once you've got the arms on, it's just long screws going up through the arms into eight standoffs. So that's very, very easy. They're all the same length screws. The standoffs are all the same. And then you can slot in the camera plates into the front of the frame and then you secure everything together with the top plate with eight screws all the way around the top plate. Just make sure where you're installing the top plate that the press nuts are underneath the top plate. So they should stick out below the top plate, not on top. That will make sure that um, those press nuts are never going to come out um, once you've tightened a GoPro down. Now, no AOS RC frame launch would be complete without a thorough black box analysis and a look at the resonant modes of the frame. So let's dive into the AOS 5 V2 and see how it performs. These logs were collected over about two minutes of flying, hard freestyle flying, and you're not going to believe me, but there's actually no damping grease applied to this frame yet. So conceivably, the performance of the frame in terms of noise could get even better if we were to apply some damping grease between the arms and the main plates of the frame. As it is, this frame is quiet, really, really quiet. Quieter even perhaps than I expected. I'm really, really thrilled with the resonance performance of this frame. You can see that there's barely any noise power below about 200 Hertz on the roll axis and below about 180 Hertz on pitch. And this is going to allow you to push the frame really, really hard in terms of the filters that you can run. You'll be able to turn off more filters, raise those filter cutoffs, potentially turn off things like the dynamic notch filter and just get the delay of the filtering down to a really, really low level, which is going to be great for the flight performance of this frame in terms of prop wash handling particularly. We're looking at the roll axis first, and this is the gyro scaled log. So no filtering has been applied and we have a central stack position in this frame. So we can see that there's really very little of anything going on below 200 Hertz. And there's just a little bit of frame resonance just coming in very slightly at maybe 240 Hertz. So if we look more closely, there are a couple of resonant modes that, that should be affecting the roll axis. The first is this standard resonant mode that we see on pretty much every quadcopter frame where the motors are bouncing up and down alternately. Now, as you can see, having a central stack position reduces the sensitivity of the gyro to this noise and having a wide platform for the frame really, really helps stiffen up this mode. And you can see that the flight controller here would be barely moving because there's, there's nothing that's uh, going on on the actual main plate of the frame. It's just the motors moving up and down on the arms. And we can see that in the black box log, we have basically no noise from that mode at all. It just doesn't exist. And that's because the central stack position is just not very sensitive to it. And the wider platform is so stiff. This mode here, which you can just start to see coming out in the black box, just above the general motor noise, is this resonant mode here. And this is the first of the twisting modes. Now having a truss structure for the frame really greatly stiffens up this mode and moves it to a much higher frequency, way above 200 Hertz and into a position where it's gonna be really easy to filter with something like the RPM filters 
and maybe the dynamic notch, but I would say that this mode is not strong enough necessarily to warrant needing the dynamic notch turned on. Let's look now at the pitch axis. Again, this is with no filtering, gyro scaled, and we have a central stack position. The pitch axis is even cleaner than the roll axis in this frame, which is um, uncommon actually. Typically you tend to find a bit more noise on the pitch axis because there's just a bit more um, inertia, a bit more mass on the pitch axis. But on this frame, the pitch axis is really, really well controlled. We don't see any resonant noise coming through at all really just this broadband motor noise that we would expect to see. If we look really, really closely at the pitch axis on the gyro scale plot, we can just see these two very faint bands, which do correspond to two resonant modes of the frame. The first is this um, bouncing mode where all the motors bounce up and down together. The sensitivity of the gyro to this on the pitch axis is going to be dependent on your center of gravity. So if you really want to minimize that, you're going to want to make sure that the center of gravity of the quad is nice and centralized. The second mode is this mode here, which again is another twisting mode. It occurs at this quite high frequency, so it's going to be really well filtered out by things like the RPM filters. Again, it's, it's just not strong enough for me to recommend that you use the dynamic notch on it because the dynamic notch does add some delay. Obviously, of course, that's up to you. And I would always suggest starting with dynamic notch turned on, but with this frame, you really could consider even turning it off. Moving on to the yaw now. Again, no filtering, central stack position, and there's really nothing going on on the yaw axis at all. The frame is very, very quiet on this axis, and you're not going to have any problems with the yaw axis bringing noise onto either pitch or roll. As more people fly HD systems, like HD0 and DJI, there is a growing desire to keep props out of the view of the FPV camera. And a common approach, a common way to do this is to use a dead cat style geometry. Now here we have a traditional squished X geometry. You can see that all four arms are the same length and they all meet in the middle of the frame and they all come off at the same angle. A dead cat style geometry has shorter arms up front typically and they tend to come out near horizontally and then longer arms at the rear of the frame and they come off at a slightly steeper angle. While a dead cat geometry does keep props out of view of the FPV camera, there are drawbacks to this approach. Different length front and rear arms really can damage resonance performance by unbalancing mode shapes, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. Longer rear arms tend to lower the resonant frequencies as well. So that can make a frame that was very high performing from a vibration and resonance standpoint, not so good when you convert it to a dead cat layout. The center of gravity of the frame is also moved forward compared to the center of thrust of the props. And this can impact flight feel. And some people report dead cat frames feeling a little more loose. To show you the impact to resonance performance, I've taken the TBS source one here the five inch version and converted it to a dead cat style layout by taking the five inch arms and angling them back slightly and then using six inch arms on the rear of the quad and angling them back at more of an angle. The distance between the motors remains the same as on the squished X layout. You can see here that in the squished X layout on this first resonant mode there is absolutely no involvement of the body of the frame at all. And that's really good because that means that the flight controller is not going to be very sensitive to this. And also the GoPro is also not being moved around by this resonant mode. If we look now at the same mode in a dead cat layout, you can see that now we have the body of the frame moving in this mode. And that's because we've changed the length of those rear arms, we've unbalanced the mode, it's no longer symmetric, and so now we have wobbling of the, the body of the frame at the front where the GoPro is, and also where the flight controller is. So you're going to see a lot more effect of that resonant mode. Also, the frequency has been reduced because we've extended those rear arms, and it's dropped quite a lot, nearly 20%. If we look now at the second resonant mode, on a squished X layout, 
again, we just see that the whole frame is bouncing up and down evenly. There's no um, pitching or rolling of the frame, so that's not going to be picked up by the flight controller. And it's also not really going to show up in HD footage as well, because HD footage is much more sensitive to rotation, which changes the angle of the GoPro, than it is just to translation up and down. When we look at a dead cat layout, however, this same mode now has a really big pitching component. And we can see that the rear arms are moving a lot more than the front arms, and the rear of the frame is pitching up and down, and that's causing the GoPro at the front to pitch up and down, and also the flight controller to pitch as well. So that is much more likely to create problems in terms of jello in HD footage, and also issues with vibration in the flight controller. Again, we also see a drop in resonance performance here. About 14% is the reduction in resonant frequency by switching to that dead cat layout. The approach that I've taken with the AOS 5 V2 and 5.5 V2 is to bring the camera just far enough forward of the front standoffs to keep the props out of view. But critically, we're retaining the benefits of the squished X layout. So we have that good vibration and resonance performance. We have those symmetric mode shapes, which are much kinder to the gyro and much kinder to your GoPro in terms of jello than the mode shapes you get with a dead cat geometry. And also we have all four arms remaining identical. So you don't need to carry different spares for front and rear arms. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the AOS 5 V2 and the AOS 5.5 V2. If you're interested to maybe try one of these frames out, I'll put a link down in the video description to where you can order yours today. And I'll also put a link to my website, AOSRC, where you can find information on all the other AOS frames that are currently available. And I'm also going to be adding information over the coming weeks on where you can get hold of AOS frames internationally in Europe, and around the world in case it's just a little bit too difficult right now for you to order from CNC drones. I'm working on a freestyle rip with the AOS 5 V2 that should be finished very, very soon. And also a massive five inch motor shootout featuring Bob Ruge's FPV cycle motors. I have been so excited to put Bob Ruge's motors up against the best of the best from Emacs, iFlight and RCM Power. You don't wanna miss that, it's gonna be great. Make sure you're subscribed and you'll be able to see those videos as soon as they come out. That's all I have for you for today. So until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.